Welcome to History of Health IT in the U.S., History of Quality Improvement and Patient Safety. This lecture covers the history of the quality improvement and patient safety movements in the United States. The focus of the presentation is to familiarize the student with some key milestones in the patient safety movement that have contributed to the present national policies related to health information technology. The objectives for this unit history of quality improvement and patient safety, are to describe conditions and notable publications concerning patient safety and quality improvement from 1959 to the present. Describe the background to the Institute of Medicine reports on patient safety. Summarize the main findings from several Institute of Medicine reports on quality, patient safety, and health information technology, HIT. Describe various ways in which HIT has evolved to improve quality or enhance patient safety. The history of the patient safety movement in the U.S. goes back many decades. Before we review some of the historical milestones, it is important to introduce a series of reports published by the Institute of Medicine, or IOM. The two reports I am about to describe are by no means the beginning of the safety and quality movements in this country. However, they are among the most important developments in how and why health IT and patient safety have grown intertwined. The first IOM report was released in late 1999, entitled, To Air is Human. The report generated significant media attention because it shockingly suggested that up to 98,000 people die every year due to medical errors. Such errors included medication errors, surgical errors, and other errors such as failing to correctly diagnose a patient's condition. More importantly, the IOM report laid out a compelling argument that most errors in medicine are the result of a poorly designed system that, generally speaking, well-intentioned clinicians are forced to work in. Some characteristics of the error-prone system in which doctors and nurses work include excessively long hours, sleep-deprived training programs, a culture in medicine that does not support open communication, an over-reliance on memory, and the lack of use of information systems that can reduce errors by eliminating the reliance on faulty handwriting and making information more readily available for medical decision-making. Ironically, the report, even with its shocking statistics, did not present any new data. Instead, it compiled the results of previous studies stemming from the work of researchers, including those working on a project known as the Harvard Medical Practice Study. When the report was released, some critics argued that the statistics were inflated. Since then, the general consensus among experts is that the statistics are accurate, or even possibly an underestimation. Two years after the first IOM report was released, the Institute of Medicine released a second report entitled Crossing the Quality Chasm. This report made several important contributions to the national quality movement. First, it defined quality of care as including six main components. The first, patient safety, was defined as freedom from unnecessary injury, such as that which is associated with medical errors. The second and third components of quality were effectiveness and efficiency. Effectiveness refers to care that is evidence-based, while efficiency refers to care processes that are not wasteful of resources. The fourth component of quality was timeliness. If care is to be high quality, it must be provided in a timely fashion. Next was patient-centeredness. Traditionally, health care has been provided in such a way that the comforts and needs of medical personnel typically were more important than those of the patients. The IOM report strongly suggested that high-quality care must take into consideration the needs of the patient. These needs can include religious, spiritual, emotional, cultural, physical, and other needs. Lastly, the final component of quality of care is equitable access. If our health care system is to become high quality, everyone must be treated equitably. Clearly, there are many racial, gender, geographic, and other disparities that must be addressed before achieving the 21st century health system outlined in the report. Secondly, the report suggested, as its title reveals, that where we are right now, compared to where we should be with respect to quality, is not a gap, but a chasm. Lastly, 
The report said that health IT plays an important role in addressing quality concerns across all six components of quality. Now that we've mentioned the landmark IOM reports, it is important to state that patient safety has been part of medicine for thousands of years. Ever since the time of Hippocrates, an ancient Greek physician widely considered the father of modern medicine, physicians would take an oath, now known as the Hippocratic Oath, that includes the phrase, first, do no harm. And while many other milestones in the intervening years can be discussed, in more modern times, the medical profession started talking about patient safety issues in the form of a book entitled Diseases of Medical Progress, a study of iatrogenic disease, published by Robert Moser. Iatrogenic diseases are adverse conditions caused by interacting with the healthcare system. Hospital-acquired infections would be an example of an iatrogenic disease. An otherwise uninfected person, by virtue of being in a hospital for an unrelated issue, contracts an infection due to being exposed in the hospital environment to a bug. The book described ways in which modern medicine was inadvertently exposing patients to these types of injuries and began to describe ways to address these issues. In the 80s and 90s, a series of high-profile patient deaths due to medical errors kept patient safety in the headlines. One of those deaths was Libby Zion, daughter of a well-known journalist, who died in 1984 at the age of 18, likely due to the care of overworked, sleep-deprived physicians. The second death was Betsy Lehman, a Boston Globe Health News reporter who died in 1994 from an overdose of chemotherapy, a situation which was clearly a preventable medical error. Both deaths occurred at well-known, highly respected medical centers, further suggesting that these types of errors can occur anywhere. In 1990, psychologist and author Dr. James Reason published a book entitled Human Error that shed light on the contribution of human fallibility to performance. In the book, Reason distinguished between errors that occur because of the way our brains are wired and those that occur because of the type of situations that humans work in. These situations, called latent conditions, exacerbate the imperfections of how human minds work, frequently resulting in predictable levels of error. The book was important because it later was used by the Institute of Medicine reports as an explanatory framework for why so many errors occur in our healthcare system. By 1991, the Harvard Medical Practice Studies were complete. Previously, we mentioned that the Harvard Medical Practice Study was the source of many of the IOM report's shocking statistics. As it turns out, the Harvard Medical Practice Study really had two main components and is referred to in the plural. The studies actually focused on malpractice issues and not medical errors per se. Specifically, the researchers at Harvard were interested in studying medical injury and malpractice litigation. So they collected data to estimate the frequency at which injuries caused by medical management or mismanagement were the result of negligence or substandard care. After combing through over 30,000 records, they concluded that harm to patients occurred in about 3.7% of hospitalizations, but only about a quarter of this harm was due to negligence. This was clear evidence that just because something bad happened to a patient, that didn't mean that the doctor responsible should be sued. In fact, in the majority of cases, negligence was not a contributing factor. Remember, these studies were completed in 1991. It wasn't until 1999 when the Institute of Medicine released their first report that the public became widely aware of these statistics. One of the authors of the Harvard Medical Practice Studies, a pediatrician by the name of Lucien Leap, published an important commentary in the prestigious Journal of the American Medical Association, or JAMA. In this article, Dr. Leap outlined the system-related issues that contribute to the high adverse event rate in medicine. Incidentally, all of these system issues were later reiterated in the IOM reports. Dr. Leap concluded his commentary with a discussion of how errors can be prevented, which included such activities as reducing reliance on memory, and improving access to information so that doctors aren't forced to make decisions on incomplete data. These and other points pave the way for why health IT is a vital component of improving the healthcare system. 
By the late 1990s, the first IOM report, which we have already discussed in detail, was published. As previously mentioned, the second IOM report was published two years later. I am including these reports in the timeline so that you can see when in history they occurred. But in the intervening year between the two influential IOM reports, a group by the name LeapFrog was established. The launching of the LeapFrog group was significant because this organization was a conglomerate of large Fortune 500 companies. Collectively, these companies buy health insurance for their employees, who represent a sizable proportion of Americans. By forming LeapFrog, these companies wanted to leverage their collective purchasing power to influence quality of care for the better. To do so, LeapFrog announced that they would only work with health companies and hospitals who are making leaps forward with respect to implementing solutions that reduced errors. Among the first set of criteria which LeapFrog began tracking was the expectation that hospitals make progress toward implementing Computerized Physician Order Entry Systems, or CPOE. This was the first concerted effort, using market forces, to encourage hospitals to engage in activities believed to improve quality, which included adopting health IT. One of the many recommendations in the first IOM report was to establish a federal agency that can coordinate and stimulate the growing patient safety and quality movement. In response to this recommendation, Congress established the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, or AHRQ, by reorganizing and refocusing a previous agency with a related but different focus. Within the new AHRQ, the Center for Quality Improvement and Patient Safety was also established. Overall, the agency became the world's largest funder of patient safety research, and the center went on to stimulate scientific breakthroughs in our understanding on how health IT impacts quality and patient safety. By the early 2000s, the number of activities surrounding the intersections of patient safety and health IT became too numerous to list. But in 2002, another milestone worth discussing occurred when the Joint Commission, which accredits hospitals, released the first set of national patient safety goals. This was an important milestone because it represented a shift in mentality regarding how accreditation of hospitals was viewed. Traditionally, the purpose of accreditation is to help assure a certain level of quality among organizations deemed worthy. However, rather than focusing on outcomes, accreditation traditionally focused on documentation of readiness to perform at a certain level, rather than a focus on processes in the system that can assure a certain level of performance. The National Patient Safety Goals were a deliberate attempt at focusing on hospital processes and systems that are critical to quality and safety. This caused many hospitals to begin thinking about system issues, similar to the recommendations of the IOM, in an effort to improve quality. By 2004, the concepts of patient safety and health IT began regularly being addressed by the highest levels of policymakers in the U.S. Several State of the Union addresses by both President Clinton and then-President Bush specifically outlined a vision for improving quality in the U.S. healthcare system with the use of health IT. In 2004, President Bush had outlined a vision that within 10 years, our country should be completely transitioned to electronic health records. Soon thereafter, he established the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, with a director who was going to serve as our country's first health IT czar. While the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT has been coordinating various IT programs since 2004, it wasn't until 2009 that the health IT czar was given significantly more oomph. With the passage of the HITECH Act, which was part of the stimulus package of 2009, many health IT-related changes were enacted. Changes is a bit of a misnomer, because the health IT vision, in many ways, was already articulated by President Bush in 2004. By changes, I mean specific strategies to accomplish the goal of complete electronic health record adoption by 2014. To help accomplish this goal, the HITECH Act makes available monetary incentives for physicians and hospitals who adopt electronic health records. The important element, especially in the context of this lecture, 
is that the unprecedented bonus payments for adopting EHRs are not simply for adopting the technology. To get the money, providers must adopt EHRs and demonstrate that they are meaningfully using the technology. In order to demonstrate meaningful use, EHR systems need to have certain patient safety and quality-enhancing functionalities built in. These functionalities include electronic prescribing, health information exchange, and other features that the IOM reports and other researchers that are part of the patient safety movement have been advocating for years. In a sense, the High Tech Act was the culmination of efforts of the patient safety, the quality of care, and the health IT movements. The increase in the use of electronic health records and other forms of health IT as a result of the High Tech Act has paved the way for greater interest in using health IT to improve quality and safety of health care. This interest was codified in another major piece of legislation, the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act of 2015, known as MACRA, which provides for Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, or MIPS. The incentives are for improving quality and using health IT to do it. In the years to come, we will begin noticing major changes as a result of this new legislation. In late 2011, the IOM released another report entitled Health IT and Patient Safety, Building Safer Systems for Better Care. In this report, the ongoing potential for HIT systems to potentially cause harm was acknowledged and it was recommended that the nation have a better way of tracking unintended consequences of HIT adoption. One of the main recommendations was to create a new federal agency that will be responsible for conducting investigations of HIT safety issues and developing recommendations to providers and HIT vendors. The report also stated that vendors should be required to report adverse events associated with their products. Previously, there had been talks that an agency such as the Food and Drug Administration that already oversees medical devices should also oversee HIT products. However, the IOM report recommended that a new agency specializing in HIT have this responsibility. In response to the IOM concerns, in July 2013, the Office of the National Coordinator published its Health Information Technology Patient Safety Action and Surveillance Plan, which outlined a series of initiatives that ONC planned to take in response to the concerns that there can be safety risks with health IT. One of the major resources they produced is known as the SAFER Guides, released in January 2014. SAFER stands for Safety Assurance Factors for EHR Resilience. These materials provide detailed guidance for major aspects of design, configuration, and implementation of EHRs. ONC also collaborated with the FDA and the FCC on the development of a risk-based framework for regulation of health IT. The report on this framework is known as the FIDESIA Health IT Report. A risk-based framework means those aspects of health IT that pose the most safety risk will receive the most stringent review and or regulation. Although it is not yet clear how the plans for regulation will proceed, it seems likely that for the foreseeable future, HIT products will continue to be scrutinized and monitored for safety. Although diagnostic errors were mentioned in the original IOM report, they did not receive much attention in the ensuing years. However, over the next 10 to 15 years, that began to change. In 2008, the first Diagnostic Error in Medicine conference was held that eventually became an annual event focusing on diagnostic errors. The Society to Improve Diagnosis in Medicine was formed in 2012. And in 2013, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, AHRQ, also established diagnostic errors in ambulatory settings as a key priority area. In 2014, a new journal, Diagnosis, was started, and finally, in 2015, the Institute of Medicine published a new report focusing on diagnostic errors. Health information technology has played a role in addressing diagnostic errors, from the early diagnostic decision support systems to prevent diagnostic errors, to the trigger tools that can mine the EHR to identify errors retrospectively. But these tools have been used infrequently, and there is still much room for improvement. This concludes History of Quality Improvement in Patient Safety. 
In summary, this lecture covered the history of the quality improvement and patient safety movements in the United States. Students should be familiar with some key milestones in the patient safety movement that have contributed to the present national policies related to health information technology.